we have Jessica Clark, who is the Coalition Publica Project Coordinator. We also have James McGregor, who is the Associate Director of Strategic Projects and Services at PKP. And finally, we have with us Jessica Lang, who is the Scholarly Communications and Repository Librarian at McGill University Library, and she'll be speaking to her experience working as a Skullcom librarian uh, collaborating with a Coalition Publica. Thanks, Liz, uh, and thank you uh, to, to Jessica and to James, who are uh, here with me today. It's always nice to make something like this a team effort. I would just like to start saying that the national na nature and therefore the bilingual nature of Coalition Publica is very important to our project. So though today's presentation is going to be in English, we encourage our Francophone colleagues present today um, to feel comfortable participating in French, and we will do our best to uh, facilitate understanding uh, between French and English during the question and answer period. And uh, the way that you can help us to do that is if you um, have the opportunity to speak, just please do so clearly and with a minimum use of slang or idiomatic expressions that'll just help everyone to understand and benefit from today's presentation. So uh, today's presentation has some kind of high level objectives, which is mainly that we want to present Coalition Publica and what we've accomplished to date, but with a, a specific focus on the ways that what we are doing is complementing the scholarly communications programs that are um, being built up at Canadian university libraries. I'm going to start by giving you an overview of Coalition Publica, what it is, how it works. Uh, we'll have a moment to hear from Jessica Lang about her experience uh, as a librarian working with us. And then James will look a little bit more in depth at, at the different roles that libraries have within our, uh, within our infrastructure. And then hopefully we'll have a good amount of time uh, for questions and exchange at the end. So to begin with, what is Coalition Publica? Coalition Publica is not a new company or a new platform. It is a partnership and uh, a combination of the strengths of PKP and EDUD in a collaborative project that's designed to support Canadian journals. Our main source of funding for this project comes from uh, CFI. This funding supports our operations and our infrastructure maintenance as well as the te technological developments that underpin our project. A really important part of what we're doing is through the partnership of op uh, for open access, the uh, agreement that we have with CRKN that now is now expanding internationally uh, and including other library consortia around the world. And uh, it's very important to us that we uh, consider uh, journals and libraries key stakeholders. Uh, they are represented through uh, Carl and CRKN on our uh, stakeholder advisory committee, uh, which also includes uh, journal members. Um, but we've also recognized a need to engage with scholarly communications librarians like yourselves, who are directly supporting journals um, within the library context. And just because I mentioned our uh, stakeholder advisory committee, I thought I'd give you uh, a quick glance at uh, Coalition Publica's governance structure. Uh, it can also be helpful to, to explain how we see the project. So uh, the Venn diagram that you see at the top um, of uh, this slide is uh, representing our steering committee. And in a way, it also sort of stands in for how we see Coalition Publica. So uh, it's a strategic alignment between EDUD and PKP, uh, where we can provide uh, services together, but both groups continue to have work uh, outside of this joint effort um, that we are still pursuing. Uh, this, uh, this steering committee uh, receives consultations and recommendations from two uh, advisory committees. One is made of international experts who advise us on our technology and our situation within the international context, and a stakeholder advisory committee, uh, which I mentioned earlier, that includes representatives from CARL, from CRKN, uh, from journals, uh, and from other players in, um, in, our, uh, in our context. And then uh, finally, we have our operations 
uh, groups that oversee the day-to-day -day business of Coalition Publica, uh, the operations team, which uh, James and I both uh, participate in, uh, the technical team who uh, oversees and develops all of the uh, technological elements of Coalition Publica, as well as the metadata working group, which is a group uh, made up of librarians who are uh, helping us and advising us on uh, best practices and technical developments for quality metadata. Um, some of you may be here today, so uh, maybe you'll uh, make yourself known uh, during the Q&A period. So uh, in terms of a brief history of what, what Coalition Publica has done to date, uh, we started out in 2017 when we received our funding from CSFI. Uh, we did some initial outreach uh, with libraries that year. Most of that was at the library director level and may or may not have included Skullcom librarians at that time. Uh, in 2018, we started our pilot project to uh, test our infrastructure. Uh, we brought on seven journals for that pilot project and they were brought in through their university libraries. Um, at that time, our infrastructure development supported OJS2 uh, and all of those journals uh, that joined us were using OJS2 at that time. Uh, also that year, we uh, renewed our Partnership for Open Access Agreement with uh, CRKN, um, which uh, gave us uh, an excellent stability moving ahead in terms of uh, the uh, financial situation that we are able to provide back to journals. Uh, we also started the elements of our governance structure by establishing our stakeholder advisory committee and developed our uh, harmonized service offer uh, for Coalition Publica. Uh, 2019 uh, was a big year for us with a lot of implementation. Our uh, infrastructure developments uh, continue to support OGS3. Our governance structure was fully created. Um, we integrated five more uh, OJS journals uh, without any um, specific um, uh, targeted outreach effort, but we are also able to um, gather in 12 other journals that were already on the EDUG platform who were using OJS. We launched our first direct outreach campaign to journals, which was quite successful, and we ended up having a substantial wait list by the end of the year. Uh, for uh, journals for the following year. We also updated our brand. We dropped the dot in Publica and um, started to work on a strategic plan, including a uh, public consultation that happened at the end of 2019. Which brings us to this year. Um, uh, we have added uh, 15 new journals to the Coalition Publica infrastructure, bringing us to a total of almost 40. Um, we realized that though we had some very successful direct outreach with journals in 2019, that we need to engage more directly with librarians, and particularly librarians that are supporting journals. So this is a strategic challenge for us this year. Um, this webinar is, is just one step in this direction. Um, and uh, we are recruiting some journals this year, um, in addition to those that we waitlisted last year. But our focus uh, there will be less on direct outreach to journals and more um, this sort of engagement with uh, library publishing service providers. Uh, Coalition Publica could be described as a, a layer cake. Um, uh, we have uh, elements and one, uh, several elements, and one sort of builds on another. Our foundation is our infrastructure, which um, Simply put, is a combination of PKP's OJS and the edud.org uh, platform, um, where that little plus sign stands in for uh, a fair amount of technical, technical developments that have already happened and are continuing to happen. Um, uh, and there are uh, a lot of uh, different uh, groups, people, librarians hosting OJS in their institution. And this is also a, um, an element of the infrastructure that we have a lot of um, uh, respect for, a little heart there, a lot of love. Um, uh, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in depth in a moment. 
uh, in terms of the services we offer, um, we offer these uh, due to our infrastructure and sort of in combination with OJS and EDG, um, offering different elements of these uh, broad service categories. Uh, and then on top, we have the partnership for open access, which in some ways you can think of as a content layer. Um, we could even also think of it as a financial layer. So the partnership for open access allows us to provide financial support to uh, the journals that participate. Um, it's also an encouragement for them to participate and helps them to cover their costs um, to, to participate in the project and uh, beyond those generate some, some revenue. Uh, from a library perspective, libraries also uh, sort of get through this uh, partnership access to uh, quality Canadian research content um, while also supporting a sort of national project uh, to transition to open. So I've mentioned our infrastructure a number of times already uh, and at a very simple level this is what it is. Um, it's uh, OJS and NED uh, with this uh, uh, transfer that happens from one to the other uh, you see there are three little letters, XML, uh, easy to type, uh, not as easy to do. Um, uh, as it stands right now, the, the infrastructure supports a movement of XML from OJS to edug.org, but eventually we hope that this connection will uh, potentially become two-way, where we could send XML back to OJS instances, maybe um, uh, we also have plans to combine usage stats, so uh, this element of the infrastructure will continue to develop. Um, so uh, before uh, explaining more of the diagram, I, I, it may be interesting to note that the, the reason why um, connecting OJS and EDUD is interesting and pertinent across the country is that um, we're really connecting uh, uh, different communities uh, that are uh, more or less Canada's two uh, de solitude, two solitudes. We're bringing the benefits of edug.org to um, many of the English language journals uh, who uh, were not um, aware of the, the platform to date. And we're also bringing the benefits of OJS to French language journals um, who have been on EDUD but are looking for uh, tools to help them manage their workflow and their editorial process. And in the process, we are building a centralized connect, uh, collection of Canadian research um, that we can take uh, and, uh, and market to the world. Uh, there are some limits of this diagram. Um, uh, I think anyone who works with OJS closely knows that OJS is not uh, one thing. It exists in multiple versions. It can be customized. Um, so that big OJS circle could actually be a collection of smaller circles. Um, and uh, uh, hosting providers are just as diverse um, from a technical point of view, perhaps, but also in terms of the services that they offer around OJS. So the uniformity here um, uh, glosses over uh, uh, something of a complex reality. Um, uh, but there's there's only so much uh, you can add into a diagram for it to still make sense. Um, uh, the main reason that we uh, are connecting OJS and EDUD is that it helps uh, reduce the production costs associated with preparing content to be displayed on EDUD. Um, we uh, are currently supporting uh, what is uh, known as EDUD's minimal XML level. Um, I am going to uh, stick a link in the chat for this, if I can manage to do that. So this is a example of a minimal XML article. Um, uh, we are continuing developments to work on uh, supporting the uh, uh, full XML le uh, level, which is like a full text version of the article, fully tagged in XML. That's what this looks like. So the second link is a full XML article. Um, the reason why this is important uh, is uh, goes back to that uh, sort of issue of the uh, two solitudes. Uh, in the Quebec context, 
almost all the journals on NUD are produced at this um, full XML level. It is uh, not inexpensive to do, um, uh, though it has a lot of benefits for uh, discoverability and future proofing. So we are looking to bring this uh, cost down, both for the journals that are already using it and also to allow journals that would like to use it um, to, to um, control their costs. Finally, um, our infrastructure is not just for publishing and dissemination. It is also a digital research infrastructure. All journal metadata and full text XML on the edug.org platform gets added to a research co corpus that can be used for uh, research and scholarly communication and digital humanities. Um, and if you have uh, any questions about what sort of research is done, uh, uh, please ask them in the uh, with this corpus, please ask them in the Q&A. Um, this research corpus is uh, currently provided under the uh, name of the uh, code.shs project, but as this uh, funded project wraps up, um, this, uh, this may evolve and this research corpus be made available in a, in a slightly different way. Um, so if we think about the library hosted context, um, uh, these are the, the services that a journal who has a OJS hosted at a university library would benefit from joining Coalition Publica. Uh, so metadata transfer and quality assurance, um, essentially their content moves um, from their OJS instance to EDUD via uh, OAI and XML. It is reviewed and corrected if necessary before it is uh, displayed on EDUD. Uh, and we also have ways to provide feedback to journals about their metadata. Uh, and we are happy to include uh, librarians who support those journals in this process, this feedback process, whenever, whenever they would like. Um, those journals also benefit from uh, increased dissemination by taking their OJS content and making it available on EDUD. Um, EDUG has a number of links with general in indexers and discovery ser services. Um, and of course, the EDUG platform is used in many, many um, university libraries, including those that participate in the partnership for open access. Uh, there are so, some supports for uh, professionalization. Um, you're really, what you're getting here is the combined expertise of PKP, which have both been around for over 20 years, our systems are calibrated to help journals meet um, DOE OAJ criteria uh, to, to include journal content in Google Scholar. Um, we can also make sure that journals that need them uh, receive DOIs for their content, which is often a mark of uh, uh, professionalization for a journal. Um, we're also uh, convening a metadata working group of librarians. Uh, which I already mentioned, um, and they are, uh, their work is going to help us um, help the journal community improve their metadata. Uh, finally, uh, both uh, OJS and EDUD have um, preservation and usage statistics mechanism. Um, OJS uh, via the PKPPN locks for preservation, EDUD via Portico and Scholars Portal. Um, which are both trusted digital repositories. Um, uh, journals uh, can access their usage statistics um, on uh, EDUD, uh, as well as uh, knowing what they see uh, through their, uh, the OJS uh, website. Uh, journal readership is not lost in a distributed context where um, journal content is on both platforms. Uh, precisely because they can see um, usage for both. And we are uh, working on developments to provide um, aggregated usage statistics for journals that use both OJS and EDUD. These will be uh, forthcoming in the next uh, few years. Uh, uh, we know that um, libraries offer a lot of uh, uh, a lot of services to journals in, in some instances. Um, uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but we, we want you to know that we're not seeking to replace uh, services that we or that you offer, but we can fill in the gaps 
um, where uh, those services don't exist. Uh, DOIs are a good example of that. You can use DOI, uh, DOIs generated by uh, journals or library, the libraries within a journal's OJS, as long as we receive it with a journal's OJS metadata. And if not, we can attribute a DOI to each article free of charge. Finally, last but not least, a really important element of the services we offer is uh, financial support. And we provide revenue to journals through the partnership of Open Access. Um, and this project also support is meant to support open access at scale. Um, so what does that look like? Um, uh, so libraries are contributing to the partnership for open access uh, through an agreement with CRCAN. Um, they're supporting open access by supporting journals. Uh, journals receive this financial support. Uh, for most journals, it covers their costs to participate in Coalition Publica, as well as generating some revenue. Uh, like I said before, libraries uh, get quality Canadian research content while also supporting the, the strategic good of uh, increased open access. And uh, for those libraries that have um, also have uh, uh, journal services, uh, participating in both Coalition Publica and the Partnership for Open Access is something of a virtuous cycle. It means that um, your journals get the money that your library is contributing to the partnership. Uh, these numbers here are an example of an open access journal that has been um, uh, with the Coalition Publica since our pilot project beginning in 2018. Um, uh, the pilot journals were added midway through the year in 2018, so they received uh, a portion of total, um, uh, of the total available funds for open access journals that year. And in 2019, they received the full amount of uh, approximately $3,500. Um, while we can't guarantee revenue, um, we are actively seeking to grow this uh, through the addition of more libraries to the Partnership for Open Access. Um, our model is, uh, it's also good to know that our model can, is, it has been and continues to be in transition. Prior to 2014, we had no mechanism to provide any financial support to journals. Uh, in 2014, we signed the first um, partnership agreement with CRKN, which uh, gave us this opening to, to return some money to open access journals and, and really acknowledged the shift in scholarly publishing towards open access. When we renewed um, the partnership for open access with CRKN in 2019, we renewed it as a five-year agreement, which is incredibly rare and provides stability um, to, to both the journals and the libraries that participate. And we've successfully grown the amount of money that we've returned to open access journals each year. Um, this model is still evolving and we're working towards an ultimate goal that all journals on the EDUD platform will be in immediate open access. Um, by then, uh, a revenue distribution model will be in place that will have a base amount that's similar to what you're seeing here, um, uh, the amount that we currently provide to open access journals. Uh, but how does that compare with costs? That's a really important element as well. Um, and we want to be transparent with you about that. Uh, the only thing that journal pays for are the costs associated with metadata transfer and quality assurance. Um, uh, this is basically because there's a real human being at uh, EDUD who receives that uh, journal uh, data and looks it over and prepares it to be displayed on the journal platform. Um, our funding through CFI pays for basically everything else, infrastructure maintenance associated with OJS and EDUD, uh, services associated with dissemination and pre uh, preservation, such as uh, DOIs. Um, uh, we're only covering direct costs associated with um, data curation. And these costs that I've listed here are an example of costs from a real journal that's in the sort of middle of the pack in terms of the number of issues and articles that um, our journals are publishing. The, this journal's OJS is hosted at um, a university library. Uh, in, in this scenario, um, 
the in the first year, the journal would have a cost of approximately eight hundred dollars and six hundred fifty dollars thereafter. Um, these do these costs don't include taxes, and taxes are calculated based on the journal's home province. Um, I can't uh, provide similar costs for the full XML. It's um, it's a highly com complex um, calculation. Uh, it, quotes have to be individualized for each journal. Um, uh, but uh, as I mentioned before, we're hoping that our developments will help bring down the costs associated with uh, full XML in the near future. So this is where I pass things over first to Jessica and then uh, to James, and we're gonna try to be more explicit about how libraries fit into all of this. So first, um, uh, over to you, Jessica, so you can tell us a little bit more about your experience. Hi, uh, may I put my video on because I don't have any interesting slides, so maybe my face will help. Um, so yeah, I wear two hats. I am the scholarly communications librarian at McGill University. We have OJS, journals we host, about 12 or so. Uh, and we've been with Ehudzi for two of our titles, Cuisine and the McGill Journal of Education for like, I think over six or seven years. Um, uh, because at the time they really wanted to be on Yahudi because of the bilingualism and um, its uh, outreach in, into the wider sort of francophone and uh, the wider world community for them. That's part of why they joined. And that was before uh, Coalition Publica launched. Uh, but I also have another hat uh, that I was just previously the editor in chief of the Partnership Library Journal. So it's hosted on an OJS at the University of Guelph. Uh, and Partnership just joined. We were in that 2019 group that kind of just got um, onboarded. So we haven't done our first full issue on Yahuji, but everything's sort of set up and ready to go. And I think the next time they publish, it'll all be done um, on Yahuji. So I've sort of seen it from both sides. Uh, in terms of, you know, what, what's, what's worked well and what's been easy and what's been hard, the hardest thing has actually probably just been the indexing agreement, um, both from when I was the, you know, both on the side of McGill Journal of Education, the ones that we were hosting, um, but then also when I was editor in chief of the partnership journal. So I guess many of you probably have seen, <laughs> you know, intense uh, indexing agreements. And so your journals will receive one and then there'll be sort of two questions of, you know, who signs this. Um, and so in the case of the McGill Journal of Education, uh, we did, um, there's sort of a backstory to that. Um, but, uh, and for, but for the case of the partnership journal, it wasn't the University of Guelph that signed it. Um, the partnership journal belongs to a greater association. So for example, maybe some of your journals belong to associations or to greater organizations, then they might be the, the organizing bodies that would sign that agreement. Uh, and so in this case, it was the, the partnership, which is this mega group of all the associations in Canada, library associations. So they were the ones that were gonna sign the agreement. Uh, and uh, that was hard. <laughs> it's probably the hardest thing to get done because they don't usually read indexing agreements, right? Um, your library associations. So working with them to understand the rules and the conditions and what it all meant um, was probably the hardest thing. And then they were a little bit concerned about liability. So they really wanted to make sure that our journal was getting signed copyright agreements that, that basically ensured that it was gonna be okay for our journal to be on this platform. Um, so that was sort of uh, my experience from being the editor in chief. In terms of the actual setup, it was, it was super easy. Um, I think they ran a test. I, I, from the McGill perspective, I don't remember ever having any issues with um, Cuisine or McGill Journal of Education to get put into the, the system. Similarly with partnership, I think they ran a test and everything was fine. Um, so in terms of technical setup, uh, we, there was never any, any issues. Uh, and Jessica, the other Jessica, as I say, has been super supportive. So anytime I had to reach out to D on with either of these two hats, um, and they've been very responsive um, and gotten back to me very quickly. So yeah, from, from my perspective, I think that was, yeah, the one thing was probably just the indexing agreement. Because it also, as Jessica probably mentions, like the cost structure really varies and it kind of depends on the journal. And so those aren't necessarily in the indexing agreement, which can be kind of challenging when you're trying, when I was trying to say to the library association, like, no, 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 like you're not going to get charged or but you're going to get money back but you don't know <laughs> exactly so that was the hardest conversation i found uh to have but the benefits are really nice i mean it's um there are um 
you know, like getting it distributed on a greater platform, having sort of like a pan Canadian platform, um, and also sort of the benefits that Jessica was mentioning in terms of preservation um, and access uh, and greater distribution. Um, I think that was the main thing I kind of wanted to say from how I've had to work with AOD in my two roles. Um, because unfortunately, I, uh, I have to leave a little bit sooner. <laughs> uh, I have a sick child upstairs. Um, so I might not be here at the end to answer any questions, but I'm going to put my um, email in the chat box right now in case someone does have questions about um, working with AOD. Uh, and, and kind of working through the, those indexing agreements. Because as I said, that was sort of the, the, the trickiest part about working with them, with them. I don't know if Jessica, you had anything you wanted me to add about my experience or Lee's or um, you think I should additionally mention? I think that's great. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I would only add to uh, sort of, to, to give you a little fun news that, that you uh, were not aware of. I got, I got this just a, a few minutes ago that the first issue of partnership is actually up on the EDD, um, uh, the EDD platform now. So oh, you can great. all go and uh, check it out and see how it looks. Great. All right, so thank you, Jessica. And um, I'm gonna pass things over to James. Thanks, Jessica. Um, you folks can hear me okay? I'm gonna yep. go with, yes, okay, <laughs> perfect. Um, so I thought um, what I would do, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit and I'll keep this fairly short um, about the um, sort of the current practical relationship we have between Coalition Publica and the libraries now um, and how that's evolving a little bit over time. And I'll go through, uh, we have a few schemas um, just to show uh, and just kind of a few highlights to, to hit. Um, before I get to that, I just wanted to, um, for those of you who uh, haven't met me or don't know me before, um, I've been involved with PKP uh, since 2007, so for a little over 12 years now. Um, before that, I was at UND uh, working at the library there at the Electronic Tech Center, which is now the uh, Center for Digital studies. I'm going to get that wrong. Um, but I did just want to note that uh, we have some other folks on this call right now who uh, were colleagues of mine. So Mike Mason and Rob Glencross. Um, and uh, I know them quite well. And I know the, uh, the journal effort there quite well as well. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to talk a little bit about, sorry, the <laughs> Center for Digital Scholarship. Mike is already correcting me. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, sort of um, our take on how Coalition Publica works with the libraries um, and, and how we see that relationship moving forward. Um, we've been at this for a few years now, uh, and this relationship is evolving. And it's actually, I, I think of this year in particular, it's evolving fairly quickly. Uh, and that's, that's, from my perspective, it's just a really good thing to see. Um, we've been working very closely with the journals um, for the past uh, two to three years. And uh, for the past year, um, we've been just really trying to, to, to get that set, get that sorted out, get the service offer figured out, uh, and, and sort of get the, the pilot study done and proceed with some of the technical infrastructure. Uh, and in my mind, I think it's this year and the coming years that our relationship with libraries will actually start to really um, solidify and, and, and bear some fruit. Um, so we do see the libraries as a critical component of the overall scholarly publishing infrastructure in Canada. Um, I think that should go without saying. Um, within Coalition Publica, uh, we consider this part of the uh, distributed infrastructure. So we have the AREDD.org platform um, that does a fair amount of the aggregation of content and dissemination out to uh, um, signees under the Partnership for Open Access. Um, but we also uh, rely on the, the, uh, the libraries to manage um, a lot of the OJS instances out there and provide a lot of um, support to those journals uh, um, through their own scholarly publication um, um, partnerships and, and, and uh, setups. Um, most of you on this call are OJS hosting providers. Um, but what we've been seeing um, over the past year or so is that you're actually um, starting to evolve, some of you anyway, um, into um, more of a traditional publishing role, or let's say a Web 2.0 publishing role here. Um, and I'm thinking in particular of a, a presentation that I saw from uh, Sonia Betts uh, last November, where she talked about the changing role of the, the library in publishing initiatives in Canada and uh, North America. 
Um, so we're seeing a change of uh, your responsibility and, and sort of what the kinds of things that you're going to be doing or that you're uh, engaged in doing with the journals um, and, and seeing the libraries reach out beyond just traditionally providing a, a home for the OJS instance. Um, at the same time, a number of you uh, still remain um, simply uh, OJS service providers. And I'll actually say PKP is one of those, right? Uh, we provide uh, uh, hosting um, services for OJS and actually nothing else really at this time. Um, Jessica, can I just get you to go to the next uh, slide? So here's a, a, just a bit of a brief schema, and I will say this is um, a, one snapshot of one potential um, environment that we see, and it's a fairly common one, um, but this is not the, uh, the strict snapshot of how we see the, the, the work proceeding from, say, a library OJS instance over to RED necessarily. Um, this is also an, a sort of a, 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 a something that's evolving over time. So as Jessica mentioned um, before, while at this time there's a, there's a fairly significant sort of one-way procedure for content to move from um, OJS hosted at the library through OAI and XML to, um, to RUD, we do see in the future, uh, we anticipate in the future, uh, information mo moving, moving back. So curated metadata would be one through XML. Uh, but also usage stats um, to, to sort of provide that overall distributed picture or consolidated picture of distributed usage, usage for the journals that we all support. Um, I'm just going to step quickly through a few of these elements. Um, so again, this is a simplified diagram just to show the passage of content through the infrastructure um, and where libraries may offer services that support that, uh, that content. So obviously content begins with authors uh, who submit to the journal. Uh, the journal uh, is typically, I think in the Canadian context, hosted at a library. And the library provides uh, technical support and the hosting for that journal. Um, once the content is within OJS, um, there's a fair amount of uh, uh, stuff that goes on behind the scenes. You have metadata that's curated by the editors. So that's reviewed, goes through review, copy editing process, all that stuff. Um, DOIs can be minted, um, and then the content is eventually uh, uh, disseminated within the OJS platform, so it's published and it's out there. Um, within this sphere, um, there's a whole range of other services that can happen um, at the library level. So there's training uh, for your editors, um, there's support for best practices, say with the metadata curation and other elements there, uh, and also just support for indexing as well within you know, Google Scholar or, or sort of other, other databases. and. Uh, uh, indexing services out there. Um, if the journal has, a, has an agreement with RUD uh, and the, the environment is correctly configured, this content uh, on publication is uh, uh, sent to RUD or RUD harvests it, and that's through OAI uh, and associated XML. RUD provides uh, an, additional an additional metadata curation step. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit more in the Q&A if there's interest in that, but um, Basically, this is just to ensure that the content that we receive just, uh, adheres to uh, the requirements that we have to distribute high quality um, content out to those partners um, who, who are, are part of the uh, Partnership for Open Access. If a DOI isn't minted, we will mint one at that time. Um, DOIs are actually a requirement for um, presentation and dissemination on the RED platform. Um, <laughs> DOIs that have been a long standing conversation within the Coalition Public Environment on how to best do it to, to support uh, the journal and also how to best do it in a way that integrates well with libraries. And I can speak to that uh, in more detail if, if that's of interest. Um, and if it's not of interest, that's okay too. Um, and then finally, uh, RED does disseminate the content on the platform and it packages it up and sends it out to other partners. Um, and it's preserved in uh, Portico and Scholars Portal on the RED side as well. Uh, next slide, Jessica, please. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about how we, uh, sorry, how you support us. Um, and uh, that's through just a range of uh, uh, different operations. And when I say us, I mean, I technically, I mean Coalition Publica, but I, I, I'm, I'm trying to mean that a little bit more broadly here. Um, and just talking about sort of um, the, the, the context of the journal and having this content published within, within Canada. Um, so most of you operate scholarly communications programs. 
uh, you're investing in that quite heavily, uh, and, and you're, you're evolving that in some cases into full-fledged library publishing programs as well. Um, I can take UNB actually as an example where they do a lot of work on uh, XML typesetting and content creation, and uh, just a, they provide a lot of additional services to the journals that work with them. Um, you provide, in some cases, financial contributions directly uh, to the Partnership for Open Access. Uh, and of course, that's part of this coalition public effort. Uh, you provide financial and community support for PKP. So a number of you are already development partners um, with PKP or sustainers or contributors. Uh, and that can be financial or code-wise as well. Or frankly, um, documentation, support on the forum, you name it. Uh, and then there are other uh, areas where you've been contributing as well, including the, uh, the Coalition Public Metadata Working Group. Again, not to, to say Mike's name over and over, but he participates in that as well, uh, as, as a number of folks here. Uh, on to the next slide. Uh, so how we support you. Um, so I, I think the, probably the core thing that we do here um, is, is, is develop um, and enhance just a national digital publishing infrastructure that complements the publishing program. So there are things that we can do um, at scale that I think can be of service to the journals and to the library. Um, and and this, this sort of goes beyond even um, developing the RED platform. Um, and we, we do a fair amount within OJS. Um, and so most of you use OJS. Uh, and, and the work that we do within the Coalition Publica uh, context that, that goes into OJS supports you sort of widely in, in, in that way. So some recent developments in usage statistics and editorial reports are supported, supported by Coalition, Fu Coalition Publica funding. We're working on um, sort of a, a doc-centric workflow uh, that uses XML as its basis. Um, and we're continuing to work in sort of this distributed usage stats infrastructure uh, project that, that I think will, will pay real dividends to OJS users and to libraries. Um, we support uh, the professionalization and the quality of your journals. And again, I mean, the, the, probably the most obvious example of that would be um, the Q&A process that happens when we ingest metadata. Um, you know, we have a production team at the RED uh, uh, offices who look through all of the metadata that comes in that, uh, and that, that in, in ensures that that sort of meets our criteria uh, for f further dissemination. And we provide that information back to the journal and lately now also back to the participating libraries. Um, but we do actually um, work in a few different ways there too. We, we write a lot of documentation um, based on, on this. Um, so, so even outside of that, that sort of coherent, concrete sort of <laughs> process where we talk to you directly, like a lot of the uh, information that we gather here, a lot of the, the results from the metadata working group, that goes back into, for example, OJS documentation, best practices guides, so on and so forth that can be shared with journals. Um, and actually, that's, that's the, the, the last uh, point there is just um, supporting uh, metadata quality in general. Um, so one question that we could talk about in the Q&A is uh, what else can we do to support you in these particular areas? Um, but we'll just go to the final slide that I have here, if that's okay. Uh, and just talking about some, some of the feedback we've received so far. Uh, and we've received this feedback as recently as last week when we had a service provider call with um, um, some of the service providers at your universities who work with OJS on a daily basis. Um, and, and what we heard there, uh, I think number one, the biggest one is just to include the actual service providers. So these are the folks, the librarians, the Skullcom librarians who work on a daily basis with OJS and with the editors um, in the uh, advisory process for Coalition Public. That's something that we've taken from this and we think we can do. Uh, we just have to figure out exactly how to do that. Um, but that, that's something that uh, uh, we're eager to do. Um, we've heard, uh, and uh, this goes back, a, 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 I think a fair while actually, is um, properly acknowledging service provider support. So that's, um, I think, in some cases as simple as just providing um, some acknowledgement within the RED platform um, that say the hosting libraries of the service providers here are part of this overall process. Um, and that they've had a role to play in getting this content out into the coalition public context. Um, we've been asked also um, to provide some transparency on journal costs and revenues, um, and we'll work towards that. I think in particular, uh, one of the comments was to, to actually highlight the fact that this is a, a, a revenue positive approach for journals, and, and we, can, we can do that. Um, we've been asked to more clearly identify participating journals on the RED.org platform. And in my mind, that kind of goes back to 
um, acknowledging service provider support, but also just providing some um, evidence to the public that Coalition Publica is an actual thing that's in use today, and that there are journals out there who are par participating in this, libraries that are participating and benefiting from it. Uh, and then finally, um, just uh, the feedback being that we uh, to, to have better communications with libraries earlier in the journal recruitment process. Um, and uh, Jessica and I in particular, I think we started that uh, this year uh, as a real focus. And I think we'll see that going forward 2020 and, uh, and beyond. Um, and James, if I could just uh, jump yep. in here Go for ahead. a second on, on that point regarding um, journal recruitment. Um, today was not meant to be a pitch uh, so much as it was a, you know, an honest um, uh, presentation about what we're doing, what we're working on, um, how you work with us. But I did want everyone here to be aware that we have a open um, call for applications for journals to join us for dissemination on EBP beginning in 2021. Um, that call is open until uh, March 27th. So if you have journals um, that you are supporting that you would uh, like to put forward for this project, you have a couple weeks in which to do so. Um, and uh, moving ahead, uh, we'll be um, providing proposals for those libraries. Uh, and that process will be ongoing until mid-June. And then over the summer, we'll be working on um, signing contracts with, with those journals that want to move ahead. So that's the, the general recruitment process that's going on right now. You can find information about recruitment on the homepage of the Coalition Publica website. I'll also put that link in the chat. So that brings us to our Q&A. Yeah, and I think there were some questions asked in the chat already, and I can just um, start with those. Um, Mary Ellen asked um, whether the uh, work in the meeting notes from the uh, metadata working group will be available, um, um, I guess, publicly. And uh, Jessica, I think you can probably answer that one. Um, yeah, uh, that's not something that we've done to date, but it's certainly something we could consider doing um, or uh, uh, consider um, uh, making some, you know, summaries available. Uh, like many working groups, uh, though those of us that are working on it have a limited amount of time. We're not necessarily uh, spending that time uh, developing uh, documents that, that can be public facing. But if that's something that this community thinks is important, we could um, we could look at doing that. The um, the final results and recommendations will be available, though I believe. Absolutely. Thanks, Jessica. Um, and there was a, uh, a question from Dana McFarland. Um, in light of this OA cost modeling for back issues, can you suggest what additional investment might be required to make participating titles embargo free? Um, uh, I might invite Dana if, uh, if she can to turn, uh, turn on her, her microphone and maybe um, just ask you to clarify uh, maybe what, you, what you're asking a little bit more. It, it, there's a couple different ways that one could take that question. Hi, Jessica, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, as I understand it, um, many uh, participating titles are open access for back issues while uh, front list issues uh, are still subscription. Is that true? Th this is the case, yes. So all journals on the EDD platform um, are published either in immediate open access or uh, with just a 12-month embargo. So any journal on the EDD platform uh, will, like, by default, have all of its back issues on the platform available in open access, and only uh, a subset um, have uh, embargo content that's embargoed for just a year. Um, so. If, uh, if what you're asking about is the, the sort of the work that's ongoing around the partnership for open access and um, moving towards a, a fully open access model, um, I'm actually going to uh, swing that 
uh, question over to um, my colleague Emily Passet from RDD. She said that she would be prepared to um, provide more information about those developments. Thanks. That is what I was asking. Yeah. Sandy, are you there? Um, Sorry, I had to allow her to talk, so she should be able to turn her mic on now. Great. Uh, okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we yep. can. Now, yes. Okay, I'm... I think we are having some uh, technical difficulties uh, with Dana and Emily. Um, uh, uh, Dana, we will uh, follow up with you following this, uh, this meeting, um, but in general, our, I can say that our ultimate goal is to work towards having all of the um, journals on the EDD platform in full open access and that we are providing revenue back to those journals at a level that allows them to be sustainable. And this is part of the, the natural, the, the, the current transition that the par partnership is going to. All right. Okay, um, I think there was another question actually from Dana as well, uh, and I'm just trying to find it here in the list. Um, is Coalition Publica working with open preprint server in implementation? And if so, are there any example titles? That's a, that's a great question, Dana. Uh, open preprint server is a new application from PKP that provides uh, basically the equivalent of OJS, but for preprints. Um, Coalition Publica hasn't talked about open preprint server just yet, and actually I'm not personally familiar with any um, current active implementations. It was launched on February 28th, I think. So um, it, it hasn't, it hasn't had a, uh, it has had some in, uh, uptick. Uh, I'm not sure of any in Canada, um, but uh, there's no reason why the, technically speaking, we wouldn't be able to include it, um, I don't think, but uh, uh, we haven't talked about it yet. And, and uh, that's, that's, um, that's a bit of a, head scratcher and, and how that, that would go policy wise, I think. Um, there is a question. Um, uh, do, uh, do you think that Coalition Publica will accept applications next year as well? Um, yes, most certainly, um, unless for some reason we have an avalanche uh, this year. So we are, we're taking on um, 25 new journals for 2021, uh, expect this be taking on the same number again in 2022. So recruitment for 2022 will begin in 2021. Um, uh, and in general, the, uh, the schedule for that is um, a call for applications in, uh, in February, March, sometime around there. In the spring, working to prepare proposals, answer questions, um, having asking for proposals to be accepted or quotes to be accepted by um, uh, sometime in June and then uh, contract uh, uh, contract uh, related questions and stuff being handled in the summer uh, with contracts due um, each year by no later than September 1st. So that's like the general recruitment timeline that we, we follow year to year. Um, so, so if you, if you've got some uh, journals in mind that you don't think you can get them going through this year, this time next year, uh, you could, you would have another chance. Um, Brianne, uh, Selman asks us a question, uh, is there any plan to target Canadian society journal publishers? Uh, thinking that that there's a great starting point, um, uh, with societies, uh, and their publishers. Um, one of the, the, the sort of uh, uh, resources that we've had for um, uh, finding journals to contact is uh, through the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences, their list of uh, member associations and all of those member association uh, websites, uh, those that indicate when they have a journal or not. So yes, it is, a, it is an element that we um, have looked at and 
will likely continue to look at moving forward. And I can follow up. There's um, a question from Will here as well. Are there any guidance documents available that libraries can be providing to journal managers to aid in proper metadata creation? And second to that, thinking of future endeavors that might help, could there be a way that libraries can help front load some of the work that would be involved in creating full XML records by directing authors to use special structured templates for journal submissions? Um, so the, the first question first, um, in, in terms of um, metadata creation, um, we, uh, and, and Mike can can jog my memory here. Um, the, we we have a new documentation hub on the PKP website, uh, and that includes a fair bit of information on sort of best practices, especially in a document called "Getting Found, Staying Found," and that I believe includes some information on um, just general good metadata practices. Um, part of the mandate of the metadata working group is to have documentation to to answer that and to provide more information about that. Um, so that will be forthcoming. Um, I'm not 100% sure exactly how that will be provided, whether that'll be directly in the, in the uh, Docs Hub at PKP or in another venue, but um, that will be publicly available. Um, and then the second question about um, front-loading XML or front-loading content, or in particular uh, providing um, structured templates for journal submissions. Um, at the moment, no, there's probably no um, great way to, to do that kind of work. We're, we're still kind of laser focused on um, developing the, the, uh, the tools within OJS to, to provide an environment for good XML document writing. Um, that's coming along. We should have um, some, some good stuff uh, happening here this year. I was actually going to <laughs> um, um, present on it or have a workshop on it at the uh, Library Publishing Forum here in May, but that was just canceled today, unfortunately. But within OJS, we are working on having um, sort of the tools available for editors and authors to, to work on the content. Um, and part of that um, will be probably some recommendations on um, not necessarily a specific template to use, but if you're, if you're going to be doing XML to stick to some sort of template. Uh, there will be more information on that. That will be at the, in the Docs Hub. Um, that's, a, that's a real big um, sort of checkbox that we have to check is to write the documentation on how to, how to do that stuff uh, uh, in 2020. I think that's it for um, for the moment for questions. Um, I did see um, just one note here from uh, Jason at CRKN, just, just noting that uh, if anyone here uh, has questions uh, for CRKN, um, they're happy to take questions from their members as well. So just a general reminder of that. Great. So I think that takes us to uh, the conclusion of our presentation. So uh, thank you uh, to everyone for joining us today. Thank you to Carl for the invitation to present this webinar and to Lise for her excellent coordination efforts. Um, we are always uh, happy to talk with libraries. Um, so please don't ever hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, I put uh, my email and James's email uh, at the end of the presentation. So we're, we're here and we're friendly and we want to talk with you. So um, please do reach out.